Behind every great man, there is an equally great woman. Octavian Augustus was undoubtedly a great man, but what about his wife? In general, the position of women in ancient Rome was, to put it mildly, not sweet. Marriage for love was mostly the lot of the poor. As for the elite, it was a political tool. A girl was not asked whether she wanted to marry or not, when at the age of fifteen they looked for a favorable party. The cases of marriage for love, let alone misalliance, were so rare that they became not only a subject for gossip, but sometimes even the rupture of relations between relatives. A woman's position did not become better in marriage. The law and society believed that women had no place in politics, and in domestic affairs, only the husband had authority over the household. A husband could give his wife a divorce at any time for any reason. For example, Cato the Younger gave his wife to his friend because he had no heirs and his wife was fertile. Although more often the reason for divorce was the adultery of a woman, Roman society was extremely negative attitude to cheating wives, but on the adventures of men looked through their fingers. Therefore, a happy marriage was a rarity among the powerful. Livia Drusilla was no exception to this rule. At fifteen, she was married to the much older Tiberius Claudius Nero. Times were difficult. Civil war was raging. Livia's father, Marcus Livius Drusus Claudianus, was a supporter of the Optimates, and so he married his daughter to his political ally. It is ironic that Livia's grandfather, the famous popular tribune Marcus Livius Drusus, who had tried to prevent an allied war, was assassinated by supporters of the Optimates, whom his son would defend. Just a couple years after his daughter's marriage, Claudian would commit suicide because of the defeat of the Republicans at the Battle of Philippi, and Tiberius having changed sides several times will join Augustus, where the paths of Livia and young Gaius Octavius will finally cross. Roman authors do not doubt that Octavian fell in love as a boy, although he was. Ruled half of the Republic Triumviru was only 23 years old. And Livia was known as a beauty and was also smart, which struck to the heart of the young ruler. Augustus put pressure on Claudius Nero to give Livia divorce, and he himself gave divorce to his wife, Scribonia, immediately after the birth of her son. Did not prevent Octavian even the fact that Livia was six months pregnant. In the act of Augustus, historians are constantly trying to find political motives because of the very serious consequences it had. Marriage with Scribonia was part of a plan to reconcile with Sextus Pompey, married to his sister Scribonia, and occupied Sicily. The divorce led to a renewed war with Pompey, which started extremely badly for Octavian. It is too much he did not time it, and in the people of such a hasty marriage also did not find understanding. There were rumors that Augustus himself Livia and knocked up. But the fact that the wedding could cost Octavian in general everything, in my opinion, clearly shows that if there was some political calculation, it went to the background because of feelings. In Livia, Octavian found a reflection of himself, a woman who was pragmatic and power-hungry, who supported him in everything but had her own point of view. Antony accused Octavian of constantly cheating on his wife, which is at great odds with the later image of Augustus as a pillar of chastity and Roman conservatism. But his love for Livia, carried through to his death, is unequivocal. He could have given her a divorce at any time, as Livia never gave him children. But even on his deathbed, Octavian would remind his beloved of the feelings they had for each other. But all this is far ahead. Meanwhile, Gaius Caesar Augustus Octavian ends the civil wars in Rome and becomes the first man of the restored republic, and Livia is always at his side. Her influence on the princeps was enormous. Octavian always consulted her on all serious matters, not only family, but also state. According to Dion Cassius, Augustus always had to prepare for these discussions, because his wife was extremely intelligent and skillful in arguments. While her husband was publicly engaged in the affairs of strengthening the state, his wife did so non-publicly. At the dinners she organized for noble Romans and Roman women, she not only learned the latest gossip, but also promoted her husband's political program. But even more important was her image in imperial propaganda. Octavian picked up the opinion of many politicians of the era. That it was the decline of morals led the Republic to fall into the abyss of civil wars. 
And so he proclaimed a course for the return of good old Roman morality, the fight against excesses and promiscuity, and the family of the first man was the visible embodiment of this policy. Livia never once by her actions gave doubt to her own piety. Her support for the temples of women's cults, women's modesty and shyness, women's fortune are qualities that the new order wants to see in women. At the same time, Livia sought to show care for the children of the emperor's inner circle to become not just the matron of Octavian's family, but the matron of the empire itself. Rumors that this care was expressed in the murder of all who prevented to achieve power to her children from Claudius Nero arose every time someone from the relatives of Augustus was sick or died. But these rumors hardly had any effect on her position, having no levers of power except for the image of the people and the influence on her husband, she managed to become virtually the second person in the state. After the death of Augustus, Livia became the protector of her husband's legacy. Octavian left her, contrary to all traditions, two-thirds of his wealth, and this money, Livia let the promotion of the cult of the divine Augustus, becoming in fact his first priestess. Livia's influence was so great that in the early years of the reign of Tiberius, she was just as influential on his decisions as before on her husband. And there were rumors, just rumors, that it was she who ruled the state, not her son. Tiberius was extremely annoyed by this, but to arrange a public conflict with respected people Livia, he could not, and therefore tolerated her, but from afar. And when at the age of eighty-seven years Livia will give her soul to the gods, Tiberius forbade any honors in her regard. Only thirteen years after her death would justice be restored by her grandson Claudius, who would deify Livia, making her now the true mother of the empire.